Welcome to today's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. For 12 days in November, CyberWork is releasing a new episode every single day. In these dozen episodes, we'll discuss hiring best practices, career strategies, team development, security awareness essentials, the importance of storytelling in cybersecurity, and as you'll hear today, we'll answer questions from actual cybersecurity professionals and newcomers. In episodes four and five, we talked about the importance of upskilling and employee engagement and retention and building stronger security teams by training for career progression, not just immediate tasks. For today's episode, the guests of these two episodes, Jessica Amato of Raytheon Technologies, Romy Rickafort of Comcast Business, Katie Boswell of KPMG Cyber, and Jason Jury of Booz Allen Hamilton get together to answer some questions posed to them at our InfoSec Inspire online event on September 22nd. Jessica, Romy, Katie, and Jason discussed finding and recruiting new and novice cyber talent, methods of making diversity a robust part of your hiring strategy, some best practices for the always scary process of moving between different career tracks, and a lot more. We hope you enjoy this 30-minute discussion with Jessica, Romy, Katie, and Jason, along with moderator Jeff Peters. And if you want to learn cybersecurity or move up the ladder in your career, all CyberWork listeners can get a free month of access to hundreds of courses and hands-on cyber ranges with InfoSec skills, which is aligned to the work roles, knowledge, and skill statements in the NICE Workforce Framework. Be sure to use the code CYBERWORK when signing up. Details can be found in the episode description below. Catch new episodes of CyberWork every Monday at 1 p.m. Central Time on our YouTube channel or wherever you like to get your podcasts. And without further ado, let's start the show. So yeah, let's jump right into it. Uh, we have a question that came in during Katie and Jason's session on building stronger teams, career path development strategies. Uh, we talked a lot about developing talent, but uh, Jennifer is wanting us to go back one step further. In particular, she's asking about uh, for some insight into how you are all are finding and recruiting that cyber pool of talent. Uh, so maybe Katie, we could start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how KPMG is finding new recruits? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of our finding new recruits starts at a campus level, right? Um, by being really engaged with strong with the with the right schools and the right teams to make sure that we're fielding the right talent with the right skill sets, so that when they come in and join us, they're able to really um, get rolling outside of our outside of our campus team. Um, you know, we rely on a really strong team of, of recruiters to help us go find those people with the niche skill sets at the particular levels we're, we're looking for. Great. And, and Jessica, what's your experience like at Raytheon with recruiting? So uh, we take on several different avenues. They're one very similar to Katie in terms of uh, leveraging our partnerships with our universities and such. But beyond that, we work very closely with our talent acquisition organization to make sure they understand um, priority and skill sets to ensure that they're sourcing the best talent. And then we look to do invitational events to get kind of wide aperture um, exposure for qualified candidates as well as the section managers that align to those in those roles. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we understand the skill sets we need um, the skill level we need, so everything from an intern to an in-college hire to a professional hire, and then wherever we can host um, virtual events, we find that there's a large lift in being able to look at those in a group fashion. Yeah, that, that leads right into another question that came in during Jessica and Romy's section, our se session earlier today. Uh, Emmanuel, he's wondering if uh, Raytheon or Comcast partners with any colleges or universities for internships or other opportunities. And it sounds like you do, Jessica, because you brought that up. Yep. Uh, so we do partner with several uh, universities across the, the, across the entire United States, as well as international opportunities. We take on foreign national students that are studying here in the U.S. Uh, the best advice I can give on how to pursue or, or how we pursue that is we typically are posting our internship recs uh, really at the beginning of the year so that all the offers are, are done and released and out and accepted by April. So in December, January, if you want to look for intern opportunities, that is the best time to look. We partner with the organizations and often do invitational events for the top candidates. Um, and they feel really special being invited to come apply for either a new college hire position to really start with Raytheon or to start building their service years as an intern. 
um, early on. That's really kind of our richest pipeline. We can work on clearances and such while they're interns so that by the time their new college hired, hires, they're really seasoned Raytheon technology professionals. Yeah, and, and Romy, do you have any college recruits on your team or, or any thoughts on uh, how those are, you know, really help with your filling your roles and you know, engagement and retention and all that stuff? Absolutely. No, we work with our talent and acquisition teams as well uh, with an internship program. So that way our business is multifaceted. So it's not just about me and sales engineering and people with technology. Our talent and acquisition people are working with universities for finance, HR, all sorts of different positions. Uh, where we can start to bring people in early, like Jessica said, to start to get to know the business and figure out, one, if, if it's them, if the company is for them and the culture is for them. You know, pre-COVID, we were all fighting for the most talented people with outgoing personalities. And so I, I think, you know, with, with, you know, these programs and having those, those relationships with talent and acquisition with those universities. It's really important, as Jessica said, to be out there early because people are looking early and they wanna make their decision. Uh, the best will probably have multiple choices, right? Of, of which internship program they wanna take because I've, I've interviewed some people and I look at what they've done in college and I'm amazed these days about the things that, that they're able to complete. But yes, it's very important to be able to, you know, work with people early on and, and you know, teach them about your company and your culture and then have them lean into wanting to be part of that. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so, so while we're on the topic of recruiting, we did have a couple questions come in related to diversity, um, and if Booz Allen Hamilton Cyber Corps or KPMG Cyber Academy has any built-in programs or initiatives to support building diverse cybersecurity teams. Um, Jason, we can start with you. Sure, so I would say with our Cyber Corps program, um, we've been pretty fortunate because without actually nominating individuals, we've had just over 50% of our participants uh, representing minorities and around 35% representing women um, in cyber. And so um, in addition to that, we also have designated cohorts that are sponsored, fully sponsored through our DNI initiatives. And that includes everything from the hiring uh, all the way to building that cyber capacity within the firm. Great, and, and Katie, do you have similar programs or similar initiatives in place for your program? Yeah, so I don't have a specific initiative in place. I think that diversity really has to be at the heart of your organization, and it, it can't be something, you know, where you're you're trying to, um, you know, fit a, a, you know, kind of horseshoe into a situation, right? So I do think that KPMG as an organization is very good at uh, making sure that diversity is a part of everything that we do. And we definitely take that into account when we are looking, um, when we are working with teams, right, to determine which trainings that we're going to run. We make sure that that's a diverse group of people that we're talking with, right? So we're getting the input of a diverse group, right, that, that will also sub support our broader community. And then also when it comes down to, you know, trainings that we might be building internally, making sure that that same diversity flows into those people that are instructing our courses um, you know we all we all want to see in those people that are um, that we're interacting with right so uh, people who are similar to ourselves and we want to make sure that we're getting a very diverse group with you know um, uh, just uh, just across the board so I'm very proud that we that's something that's really at the heart of what we do yeah, and we have another question here from Neil who would like some advice on transitioning into his next job as a full stack cybersecurity professional. Um, that, that's one of the most common questions we get here at InfoSec is people looking to transition into cybersecurity or transition from company to company or within company into different roles. And everyone has seems to have some anxiety uh, around that. So I'm uh, hoping we can spend a few minutes getting to your thoughts around that, that transition. Um, Maybe, Romy, maybe we can start with you. Uh, has your team dealt much with people transitioning into a sales engineering role, and do you have any advice on job transitions in general? Yeah, you know, the biggest advice I give people, and now that we've developed the framework of what each role, you know, expertise needs to be, and I know there was, you know, a, a breakout session today on some of the cybersecurity frameworks for jobs that are out there today, that the advice I give people is, is don't wait for somebody to push you to do it, right? But what I always tell everybody is if there's a position you want to go after, you figure out what that framework is as a company, as, as me as a leader, I try and build that framework for them. 
but it's up to you to be ready. And I, I think I used the quote earlier with Jessica, it's better to train for an opportunity and not have one than have an opportunity and not be prepared. So it's up to yep. you as an individual to go through the learnings, to go through the books, to go through the training. So that way you have a fundamental understanding of what it is that that role does. Network, work with people who are in, this, who are in the industry to figure out, hey, how, how did you get there? What are the steps that you took? Because it's not, you know, cybersecurity itself isn't a, a, a solo person game, right? It's a, it's a team sport, right? And there's always everybody on this call, I think, is looking for teammates, right, to help their companies. And so it's really important for people to network and to, to start to really figure out what exactly a Booz Allen Hamilton or a KPMG or a Raytheon are looking for. And that way they can start to, you know, take the initiative on their own to learn how to be a cybersecurity person or at least be considered for one of those roles. And if I could just add three things to that, is that okay? Sure. So really, um, Romy and I are, are, are definitely, our organizations are, are functioning a lot alike, but Raytheon really pushes you to drive your own career. You're in the driver's seat. So there's three key factors you need to know um, just like when you start a car for the first time, there's a few things you need to know to drive that car. Your, your career is no different. You need to network. So you need to know that early on, those first connections you make, that ambassador that helped you first day, that's the first starting foundation of your network. Your network is key to helping you answer those questions. The second piece to that is, you know, Romy said, don't wait. Don't wait to be told. Go seek the information. Be hungry and be passionate. And then third is if you see something you think you might like, you're not sure, and you really want to understand, is this the next right rung for me? Go talk to people that are doing it. What do you like? What do you don't like? And then bring that back to your mentor and go and, and have that open mentorship conversation to really understand if, if this is a fit for where you should go. And then the rest should be laid out for you curriculum wise and what, what things to go study. But you got to answer those first three things before you can go drive in your career. And those are the key attributes to, to really being successful and happy in what you're doing. Yeah, and, and Jason, have you seen anything um, or any advice in terms of either, you know, tra individuals transitioning or even at like the organization level in, in terms of how that helps? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the most common questions that I get. Um, and not just at work. This is from family and friends that know that I work in this field, right? They come over for a meal and you know, I'm not the sales guy, but I'm the L&D guy. But yeah, I think, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we hosted an event called Start a Cyber, Start a Career in Cyber at Booz Allen. And it was open to everyone. And we had over 300 existing employees that were not aligned to a cyber role, raising their hand saying, I'm really interested. And these are people who are developers. These are people who are doing like, you know, physical security. And so what we realized was, that was a way for us to really start to actually help that pipeline. And so we developed different sites that helped them out. But going back to what Jessica and Romy said, um, the individual really needs to take the initiative, right? And I always, I always ask people when they say, I wanna get into cyber, I say, what role? And most mm -hmm. of the time, they don't really have an idea or it's networking <laughs> or hacker. And there are so many different roles, right? And so I always ask them that. And once they say, okay, I want to be a, you know, sysadmin. Okay, have you looked up what a day or a night in the life of a sysadmin looks like, right? And we have a lot of those videos on our internal portals, but there's a lot of that out there already. So I just always encourage you to explore, ask questions, which is part of what Jessica said with networking, and really try and answer as many questions as you can before you start knocking on doors. Um, and just realize that you could have the certifications, you can have the experience, but if nobody knows that you're that talented, then no one's going to come and knock on your door. So it is really driven by the individual. Um, but yeah, I think it is a very popular and relevant question. Yeah, and Katie, do you have any thoughts on, on transitioning? 
No, no, this, this group covered it really well, I think. I mean, you if, if you're not speaking up and telling somebody, I'm interested in doing this, then nobody is going to know to help you. Um, and I think, you know, looking at it from the lens of organ from the lens of the organization, right? You need to make sure that you have a structure in place that's going to allow people to raise their hands and say, hey, you know, just like Jason was saying, you know, they had an event that does this, right? If you have, um, if you have in your organization a system that allows people to safely raise their hand and say hey I'm, i've heard about this thing called cyber i'm really interested in it right then you're going to get very strong candidates right who already understand your organization right especially if they're already an employee they understand your organization they understand what it takes to be successful you know their their track record right as a team member and so um it's a really sound investment in your time to then go invest in helping them get the skill sets that they need in order to make that transition because you'd much rather have them transition to an internal role within your own organization than go well it's easier to find something externally right i'm going to go i'm going to go answer that email from that recruiter so it's a sound investment from that standpoint i think mm -hmm. uh, we have another question that came in from jessica uh, or it's from Angeli to Jessica. Uh, she, uh, Angeli wants to know if the uh, cybersecurity training and upskilling programs uh, at Raytheon that you discussed dovetail at all with any other professional development or engagement initiatives managed by other departments, you know, like HR, L and D, um, and just you know, kind of some general thoughts on on how those work together, or I assume they work together. <laughs> Yep, so uh, the alignment is, is just that. We are directly connected even as part of the DT organization with our HR talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion and, and other groups across RMD um, because it's more it's important that we don't just build programs that support DT. Some folks that start in DT end up as software developers. Folks that are software developers end up in DT. So uh, we do have programs, curriculums and paths like that that do exist. Um, additionally, for new college hires, we have a learning development program, which gives them 18 month rotation um, in three to four different roles um, so that they can try out different things as part of that leadership development program. Um, and so there's there's multiple avenues to pursue that, but we do have those things laid out and we are in complete partnership with the organizations that help support those so that folks can get a fully rounded experience to make not only the best of the role that they land in, because now they're taking just not only their, their training in, in school and whatnot, they're taking real life experiences in different roles in different parts of the business, which makes them uh, stronger in whatever final positions they end up in. So the leadership development programs, one avenue, and really that open discussion with your boss on where you wanna go. Are you on a technical track? So we, we track the ta talent pipeline on understanding Who's got a track and interest in leadership and what's that look like versus ones that want to be fellows and what's that look like from a technical perspective versus a leadership perspective. So we do have those laid out at Raytheon. Um, yeah, we had another question come in around employee feedback and particularly uh, you were talking about surveys during your sessions. I think both of both during both sessions. And so the question is just um, you know, they'd like to know more about like how these surveys work and if the how that really fits into your employee feedback is that the best way to get employee feedback is obviously it sounds like that's a really important uh, piece uh, in terms of you know the programs overall um, so yeah Romy I know you were talking a bit about surveys um, is that is that your primary method for getting feedback or where does that fit into your program no it, it definitely is it, it's one that you know we worked to a every two month cadence on checking employee satisfaction we have an ENPS score and so that net promoter score is whether or not they recommend one of our products and services to, or would they even recommend Comcast as a place to work? And with that, though, they have the ability to provide what we call verbatims or uh, feedback that they'd like to give. And, and I really, one, we look at the scoring, but the scoring usually trend lines the same depending upon the month and if there's a major change, unless you're trending downward and then you'll have to find a way to, to figure out what's happening. But a lot of that comes from employee feedback and the feedback is where we really look to make business process improvement, right? A lot of the things that the echoing that happens between the employees are things that we can improve a lot of times, right? I mean, you can't fix systems, tools and processes quickly, but you can at least find guardrails or to make things easier for them to do their, their work and their job. And, it's really important for us as leaders to, to really listen and lean in instead of, you know, look at them and say, hey, 
all right, there's a lot of complaints here. They're not really complaints. They're ways to actually improve processes for the business and make everybody you know, a lot happier when it comes to being able to eliminate those barriers. So it for us, it's important for us, you know, the happy employees have better interactions with our external customers as well. And also happier employees make better connections internally at the same time. So we need to, as leaders, make sure that we're well connected of how our employees are feeling. Great. Yeah. And Jason, do you have any advice around getting employee feedback, whether it's through surveys or other methods that you find the most useful? Yeah, I think it's a mix. We do a lot of real-time feedback. So during our sessions, we also have a social platform. So in some cases we use Slack or Yammer. And so we're constantly seeking their feedback. It may be through a, a quick survey. It may be a random call from myself or one of the individuals on my team, but definitely we take all that feedback in with each cohort that we run and then we slowly evolve and make it better and better with each and every one so definitely feedback is very important for us and we capture that a few different ways we break it down by the boot camps that they've attended and also some of the other events that um, they attend as well where it might be more of like a fireside chat or career advice or something like that yeah, and, and uh, COVID and the pandemic came up during uh, both of your guys' sessions, and we have a question that came in from Jeff. It's kind of interesting related to that. He's wondering if if any of you think that the interest in IT and IT security jobs is increasing due to some people trying to get into a job that can be done remotely rather, in per rather than in person. Um, so yeah, Jessica, I know you do a lot of hiring. Uh, do you get yeah. the sense that that's a, a major driver? Uh I definitely, I have not seen a lull, let's put it that way, um, but also the growth in our business has also driven our seeking. So I, I'm looking for more people. So folks that are interested in IT and cyber roles, we do have several positions open, but I, I definitely do have seen a, a very large uptick on the cyber side of things. And I think that COVID drove some of that, I think. The state of our, our our union, our government, has also driven that, and the realization of what can what damaging things can be done with that little bit of information, and then how do folks get their hands on it, and and how do I become a defender of that? So I, I've definitely seen an uptick. It's probably been more in the cyberspace, but I've also seen an additional interest in learning it in folks that weren't traditionally um, that didn't traditionally go to school. They maybe went and got an MBA because they didn't know. Um, and now suddenly have an interest in IT. So I think it's, I think COVID maybe drove some of that, but I think it's also the nature of our world. I mean, we hold little computers in our hands that do everything from navigating me from A to B to doing my banking, to taking phone calls even still, and then also being able to check emails from school on the road. So, I mean, I think all of those things have really fed into an uptick and there certainly hasn't been a lack of growth from the need side. So not only do we have supply, but we also have demand. Yeah, and Katie, have you seen any any change in terms of that supply and demand, you know, due to the, the pandemic that's going on? Yeah, I think definitely um, the organizations that, you know, we work with at KPMG, they're looking to respond to be able to accommodate their workforces, right, and the needs that they now have. Uh, so, you know, people who were typically able to go into an office previously to work, now they're trying to figure out ways to do their job remotely. So we definitely see an increased demand in cyber professionals to help solve these problems in a in a secure manner. So the demand has definitely gone up uh, from, from that perspective. I don't know that I've seen um, that demand in uh, positions necessarily go up. Um, I, I do think, though, that they're more important than ever, right, that we have the right skill sets to be able to, um, you know, go out and deliver the, the work that we have. So it's made the learning and development and the and being able to be agile with our learning and development programs even more important because we can't just say, oh, you know what, since we can't have that in-person training, you know, we're just going to put that off until the end of COVID, right, because we, we don't know when that is. So it's causing us to have to be agile um, in conjunction with our clients and sure that we're able to have the skill sets to deliver the work that the demand is there for. Yeah, that, that's interesting, Jason, what you said, because it seems like this pandemic could go on, you know, into the, I know some companies have already announced like work at home, like throughout the coming year. Um, so uh, is that something that you're actively thinking about? Um, 
you know, if this continues to go on, how you're going to, um, I don't know, make any changes or do anything in response to it? Yeah, so I will say I'm I'm really happy that we actually, um, our initial program was blended. It was a little bit of instructor-led and then some virtual, and then we slowly realized that if we wanted to scale our program, and most, actually all of our training programs now, we had to convert them to virtual instructor-led. Um, and so we actually had that up and running before uh, COVID uh, uh, came. and what we found is that there are there have been some improvements that we've made but definitely um just really continuing to evolve on like you know even like little things like breakout rooms and just becoming more familiar with a lot of the technology that we're using um i think one of the challenging areas for us is when you start to actually uh use labs um, because you know having the ability to look over the shoulder of an individual and we we are working with different vendors that offer uh, labs um, that allow you to do that virtually. Um, but it's just the little things that you don't really think about until you're put into that screen and you say, oh my God, how am I going to get this score? How am I gonna provide this person with, um, with you know, recommendations? And then there's other things that you have to consider too, like having you know, a producer for your events because it's unfair to have a facilitator doing everything, managing the chat, also teaching. So yeah, definitely, um, definitely, we're continuing to make changes. But happy to say that we had that in place before all this hit us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then Romy is someone who's you know managing a team of of, of engineers. Is there anything that uh, has really changed in the terms of the day to day job duties or training or anything like that? Yeah, you know, I mean, the three things we focused on, right, as we've made all the decisions since COVID started have been our people first, and then um, our customers, and then third, making smart business decisions, right, to to maintain, you know, our trajectory as a business and to, to remain, you know, in, in the position, the fortunate position that we're in. When we think about, you know, what's changed for sales engineering, it is some of the virtual piece. And, you know, one of the things, you know, here being InfoSec or, or being with you InfoSec, you know, the, the programming that you guys have available from a training perspective is something that our SEs really leaned in on. Right? We have places where their commutes, people's commutes were two and a half, three hours a day to get to their jobs in California or even Houston. And people found the time right, to, to be able to now take, you know, training and, and to fulfill like some of that extra time. They weren't just watching Tiger King I actually watched the uptick in <laughs> Jessica's lap. Um, <laughs> but I, I loved watching, right, the engagement that our employees had in knowing where we're going as a company still, leaning in into InfoSec and security skills training and network training. But also, you know, we also, in, in our breakout session, I talked about LinkedIn learning and not <laughs> my leadership no longer lets me call it soft skills. They now call it essential skills, but it's learning how to communicate, learning how to present, and it's things that you can start to learn virtually. I'd love a, a time when I can visit markets again and really see people up in front of a room and presenting you know, live and in person versus over, <laughs> over video camera, because you don't always get to see you know, some of the thing, other things that are happening, but no, I, we, we really have leaned to how can we de do things virtually. We're still looking at you know, what re-entry looks like into the marketplace at some point, especially with our folks being sales focused and customers, you know, who who actually want engagement from our vendors as well. So we're we're making those decisions and we're not making them haphazardly by any means. And it's you know, if you focus on your people first, keeping them th them safe, and then your customers second, I don't think you can really go wrong. Great. Yeah, it looks like we're just about out of time. Got a couple minutes left. Um, Seeing that this is the last public session here at InfoSec Inspire, I think it's probably good to close on, you know, some general takeaways. I know we didn't really get a chance to to ask uh, Katie or Jason that during their session. So, um, you know, everyone is obviously always looking for that secret sauce to building a successful program. So, uh, you know, what would be the best piece of advice that you've gotten that's helped you uh, with the programs that you manage? Uh, Katie, we can start with you. Do you have a, a nugget of wisdom to share? 
Yeah, I think make sure that as you're looking to build teams um, and build learning and development programs, that you're engaging um, your, you know, key team members as much as possible. You're engaging those people who are really plugged into, um, you know, your your broader community. Uh, make sure you're asking right people's opinions. We talked about surveys a little bit. Get get direct feedback. You know, you can't just be thinking about, um, you know, where you as an organization want to go, but you also need to be thinking about where individuals are looking to go with your careers. You can't assume that those are going to be the same things, right? So if you have the right input for, from both sides of that scale, then you're going to end up on uh, a path that is, you know, mutually beneficial, right? Um, and I think that that's been really key for us in building a program that gets good feedback is, um, you know, it, it, it takes it takes everybody's needs into account from our customers to our internal team members, our leadership team members, um, you know, and that's how we really find a path forward. Great. And, and Jason, I'll let you have the final words. Any advice that's helped you or that you've learned along the way you'd like to share? Sure. So I would say there are so many amazing self-paced options, labs, things that you can assign people. But what I've learned is you can't assign people long, long, you know, list of courses. You need that human intervention. They need somebody to talk to. They need somebody to ask questions. They need a mentor. Um, and so I think when you're building a program, you want to have those checks and balances and you want to have a nice variation of, you know, practitioners, the L&D folks, the mentors who have gone through the same program. Um, so, yeah, I would just say while it's very convenient to assign a lot of self-paced training, just keep that in mind um, that, you know, people are still required. Thanks for checking out this Ask Us Anything episode with Jessica, Romy, Katie, and Jason. This marks the conclusion of our series, Developing Security Talents and Teams. Tomorrow we begin our second track, all based around security culture and security awareness. You can join us then for our first episode, Storytelling Cybersecurity, the Impact of a Great Story, with speaker Sarah Moffat. Cyberwork with InfoSec is produced weekly by InfoSec and is aimed at cybersecurity professionals and those who wish to enter the cybersecurity field. New episodes of Cyberwork are released every Monday on our YouTube channel and on all podcast platforms. To claim one free month of our InfoSec Skills platform, please visit infosecinstitute.com slash skills and enter the promo Cyberwork. All one word, all small letters, and you can get a free month of security courses, hands-on cyber ranges, skill assessments, and certification practice exams for you to try. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow for more Cyberwork. Bye for now.